What is up everybody, welcome back to the channel. Get your popcorn ready because this is going to be a long one. And rightly so, we are gonna be diving into F-Log and F-Log 2, as well as talk about some of the in-between things about using Fujifilm as a whole. Personally, I use F-Log 2 for a lot of things. I use it for this talking head video as well. And I think it's a fantastic log profile that they've introduced, more dynamic range, detail, and beautiful color. Now this is gonna be sort of an interview type video, but there's gonna be a ton of B-roll, graphs, all that stuff, so you can kinda of enjoy, but also take in the information that we're gonna to try to relay. Now some of this is pretty basic for those who are just kind of getting started into Fuji or who want to learn more about it. But there are some advanced tips in here that I learned that's gonna help my workflow. So yeah, I will be interviewing Evan Snyder in case I didn't actually mention that. Evan Snyder, he is a filmmaker and colorist based out of LA, and he is a fellow Fujifilm user as well. Now, definitely you should check out the chapter markers. There's some, again, beginner stuff, but also some immediate stuff. So you can click around to listen to the parts that you wanna hear. Um, and lastly, what's your thoughts on long form content like this? Uh, who else would you wanna see on the channel that I can interview and talk about some of the things about filmmaking as well as getting to commercial side and narrative or doc? Uh, so I would love to hear your thoughts or questions below from the video. Uh, I will be jumping in from here and there because there's some parts that we kind of kind of went through quickly and I want to clarify it. So if you see me, that's what I'm going to be doing. All right, let's jump right into this. Cool. Evan, thank you so much for your time. Talk talk about who you are. Tell us who you are real quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Evan Schneider. I'm a DP and colorist uh, based in Pasadena, California. I've been a freelance colorist for about, I guess, uh, almost 10 years now. Yeah. Oh, wow. You're seasoned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I started off working at a color house in Santa Monica, working on like feature films. Now I've transitioned to freelance. Um, so I work out of my own office. And um, yeah, my time is split between mostly doing color grading stuff and then also DPing, shooting. Um, I work on mostly uh, commercial work and then some documentary. Yeah. Let's just jump right into F Log 2 and just F Log. So could you explain what is F Log? and F-Log2 and, and the Fujifilm system and, their, and the log, their log profiles? F-Log2 in general um, allows the X-H2S, which is the only camera that can shoot F-Log2 at this point, um, but it, it basically allows it to capture a broader dynamic range um, between the shadows and the highlights. So you're gonna have a lot more um, latitude to save your highlights, to save your shadows, um, just a lot more dynamic range to work with so that when you do grade it, you have access to more yeah, information. Yeah, yeah. I noticed some people were complaining that the I, base ISO for F-Log2 is 12,050. I'm sorry, not 12,000, uh, 1,250. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you test on why the higher base ISO versus the 640 base ISO for F-Log? Now, if you were to look at the log curve chart for F-Log and F-Log2 on the Fujifilm website, you'll see that the middle gray point is lower for F-Log2 versus F-Log. Now having a lower middle gray point gives you more information in the midtones. And I would highly recommend watching Gerald Dunn's breakdown of dynamic range and ISO for the X-H2S. Um, fantastic findings for it. He, does a, he has a more technical standpoint because he has the machinery for it. But from our eyes and reading charts, that's just what we can kind of give you. One of, one of your comments on one of my tweets is like, uh, you said um, something about you shouldn't overexpose yeah. the vlog too. I, had, I didn't, that's something I, I just kind of do. So why, why shouldn't you uh, overexpose your uh, F-Log 2? So the main reason uh, that, in my opinion, that you don't want to overexpose it is you just don't have to. Um, I would rather save the highlights than risk possibly overexposing some of them because since F-Log 2 gives you so much more dynamic range to work with and it's retaining a lot of shadow detail, you actually really want to just err on the side of even lower. Like I usually try to keep my exposure um, like in my tests, keeping it around zero to like 0.3 on the meter generally um, was like a good balance because I think you can always bring up the shadows. You can always denoise, but if you blow out any of the highlights, um, they're then they're totally gone. Yeah. yeah. Right off the box, when I was starting to shoot F log two, one thing that didn't give me confidence was looking at the screen because the screen, I think it's the same screen on the X T four. 
So when I saw that there was so much just digital noise and crushingness on the screen, even though I had the histogram, I was like, okay, I feel like I need to overexpose because I'm, I'm sure I'm going to see all that disgusting muddiness in the file. But when I brought the file in, if it was closer to zero, it was still clean in a sense, you know, so I could still work with it. I could still clean it up later. It wasn't as bad as it looked on the screen. So I would say those who are just now getting the camera shooting F-Log 2, don't trust the screen. I wish they had more exposure features on the camera. That's one complaint I have. Um, the, the, the histogram is okay. It works, but like a waveform would be nice, you know? Are you, uh, are you using the F-Log View Assist on the camera? No, I'm used to just seeing the, I'm, I'm, I just leave it as the log and then I just judge it off of the, uh, uh, the histogram. Uh, histogram the histogram i just judge it off of that um, okay wow. yeah because i found like i'm pretty sure the f-log view assist that it has it's using the same luts that they um offer on their website for free i'm pretty sure it's like almost the exact same thing is that something is that something i should do or something you you would recommend to do using the F -log i mean assist? i would recommend it i know that like up till now that hasn't really been a feature that they have on cameras. So like, I think people like you and a lot of people have gotten used to just looking at the log image and exposing based on that. Um, and like my background, I actually come from shooting on red. And so I actually have a red Epic dragon that I use for like my main client stuff. And so like the workflow with red is since you're shooting in raw, you can change all of the color space and the gamma, yep. everything I after the it. fact. So when you're shooting, you're still looking at a rec 709 image. And then when you grade it, you can convert it to the red log 3G10, like all the red log stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I think once I saw that they had the F log view assist on, I was like, oh, thank goodness. Cause like that is a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. And like before, like, I came from the X-T3 um, yeah. and pretty much any time I shot in F-Log on the X-T3, I was using my small HD monitor with a LUT loaded onto it because I just like, mm -hmm. I'm not as used to like... Smaller mirrors cameras or something like that or... Yeah, and like viewing F-Log on a small screen <laughs> with manual rough. focus, it's just it's like rough. you can't <laughs> see anything. So yeah, it's just clustered. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Yeah. yeah. What you're talking about, like underexposing F-log and being worried about um, worried about like muddiness in the shadows. So, I mean, that's like one of the like this camera is so clean. I've been just blown away by how clean the image is yeah. and um, I feel like we've all been kind of traumatized by shooting like Sony S log in like 420 8 bit. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is definitely muddy. And yeah. that's one of the yeah. reasons why it was always recommended to shoot overexposed because mm -hmm. you're basically changing the middle point of the log encoding. I mean, kind mm -hmm. of. Um, you're basically like saving the shadows from getting muddy. But yeah. the beauty of this is you can shoot in 422 ProRes HQ 10-bit color. 10-bit color, yeah. And oh, I, that, I love saying that. I love being able to say that about this camera. <laughs> yeah, it's so nice. It's so nice. That's, that's all I shoot. That's all I shoot is ProRes. It's such an easy workflow. And yeah, we can we can talk about codecs later and stuff like that. But you, yeah, you made a good point. So you're so in a nutshell, you don't have to treat this the F log two like you would treat Sony S log two or S log three. You can you can you can save your highlights, so shoot a little bit a little bit under. You don't have to kind of you know two stops over whatever, and then you'll be able to still clean it. Up. And and I attested that you can still clean it up. I've gotten some fantastic imagery so far out of this camera based on based on even with shooting sometimes overexposed, but the things that I shine closer have looked really good. So that's good to know. For sure, yeah. I'm curious. I have a question for you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How uh, like in your experience so far, how does it look compared to your uh, black magic 6k oh that's a fantastic question i'm about to do a comparison to it too but i still prefer the image out of, i still prefer the image out of the 6k pro there's something about how the highlights are treated and and just the the gradation between highlights and shadows is this as much more uh 
gentle roll off, I guess you could say. Now, along with me talking about the highlights and how that's treated with the 6K Pro versus the X-H2S, another thing I, I prefer is um, the, the type of sharpness, how sharpness is handled in the 6K Pro versus the X-H2S. In the Fuji camera, it's a bit too detailed. Now, you can definitely turn down the sharpness and noise reduction in this camera, but I just, turned, I just tend to see that it's still too sharp for my taste. Um, and that's just a preference. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I just prefer the look of the 6K Pro, how it handles color, um, highlight rolled off, shadow roll off, all that stuff versus the X-H2S. Now, the X-H2S is still a very powerful camera um, and the image and, and everything in there is really great. Now, I do want to say I want to test out what B-roll looks like out of this camera. Is it going to be exactly the same? If that's the case, then I have a smaller 6K Pro in my hand that can shoot open gate, which would be kind of insane. I still, I, I, I'm curious to see how well I can match these two, um, especially since this can shoot B-roll. And that's something I, I need to grab, get my hands on. I need to get one of the monitors. Have you tested any external RAWs yet? No, I really want to get the uh, the video assist so I can try yeah, that out. Yeah. I'm really curious. Yeah. I need to do that because that's, I think that's another thing most cameras don't. This thing, just like, well, just like Panasonic now, Panasonic does uh, ProRes RAW or Blackmagic RAW. The fact that this can do it, that's really um, great to see. Yeah, I, uh, I picked up the Fringer um fx to ef adapter so mm -hmm. i've been shooting most of the stuff on the sigma art lenses so yeah mostly i have like right now i'm shooting on the 18 to 35 1.8 mm -hmm. art which is like my favorite lens in the history of lenses just like for its versatility everybody's everybody's favorite lens <laughs> yeah and i'm I just like the, uh yeah i know yeah. it's it's like it's a lot but everybody loves it but uh, I had it. I had it, too. There's no worries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's been great on this camera and like the mm -hmm. 24 to 70 is great because it has the mm -hmm. image stabilization. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that paired with the internal stabilization is like a good combo. I was super stoked to see that they fixed that because um, I actually before I had the X-T3, I had the X-H1. I had one, too. I had the X-H1, too. Yeah, that the IBIS in that one was like unusable. And yeah, yeah. that was, was like one of the main reasons I bought it. And I was so bummed that like I always had it turned off. So back yeah. back then I actually sold the X-H1 and got the X-T3 and was just kind of like using that to wait it out until they did the X-H2. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, OK, I got a question that I've been uh, really wanted to ask you. And it was in this actually here on the list. It's about using film simulations. Now, I stayed away from using film simulations on the, the previous X, um, the Fuji cameras because they're, they're all 8 bit. Even though the XC4 had 10 bit, it was still 420 10 bit, and I didn't do any external recording with that. Yeah. And I always, it was always difficult for me to massage that look where, it, where I wasn't crushing anything or blowing out anything. Now that the XH2S can shoot enormous files with ProRes and all that stuff. Have you tested the film simulations and have do you have any favorites or anything like that that work well in that color space, even though it's a, like a Rec. 79 crush? Uh, you know what I'm trying to say. I don't know the language yet, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I, I actually do feel like their film simulations really push the contrast. Like I actually one feature I wish they had was to be able to have the curves editor, but for a mm -hmm. video, because like it'd be nice to be able to counteract some of the contrast with the curves editor so yeah could like boost up the shadows or bring down the highlights wait i thought it's in there because i i changed up eterna with the highlight and oh really um yeah with the curves editor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh. in the camera right yeah yeah for video mode yep yep oh yep, wow video mode. i actually oh i guess well yeah cool. no you can, you can do that yeah Sick. you can do that you can do that yeah because <laughs> um i haven't been a fan of eterna because the way it handles my skin tone yeah but I did make a, I've been just experimenting with different. Man, I should have just gotten the X-T4. I don't know what I was thinking. Oh, it's, it's probably, it's probably not an X-T3 then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I, so I also just, this is random. I also just picked up a X-E4, the X-E4 oh, yeah. for photo. Um, yeah. With the 27 that's my, millimeter. That's my photo camera. Yeah. Some of you already know that I sold my X-E4, not because I wanted to, um, because I kind of have to, had to. 
That being said, I will be getting a XS10 eventually. Um, I'll try to find a used one somewhere. Um, or, or eventually another XH2S or something like that. I, I definitely want two of these hybrid cameras because it makes it a lot easier with workflow and just how things are just kind of handled um, for making content. So, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. dude, it's so nice. And like, I just actually shot some B-roll with it. Um, <laughs> dude, that looks so sick. I love the thumb grip. It looks so good. Yeah, it's yeah. so good, yeah. I actually just saw, shot some B-roll with mine um, in Eterna, and I was mm. like, oh my gosh, this actually looks like decent. It's not bad. Yeah, I shot in Eterna because I don't think F-Log is worth it on there because it's... No, it's, it's only 8-bit, yeah. Yeah, so you don't want to do that. But I mean, it was in like a studio environment too, but yeah, I'm curious to test that out more. But with the film simulations, so... Yeah, like the the four two two ten bit, like the benefits go throughout the entire camera. Basically, like mm -hmm. um, I did some comparisons just in my studio with a color checker, um, where I compared like F log F log two, and then I went through all the film simulations, and I would say my favorite film simulations right now, classic Chrome is like one of my favorites, because um, like when I'm shooting like landscapes and stuff, I feel like the colors from classic Chrome are a little more earthy. Um, yeah. It's like, it's, and it's not like super contrasty. Um, I've been shooting photos a lot with, um, with Astia soft. Yeah. Um, I feel like that one has like a little bit of a warmth and it's like really yeah. nice with skin tones. Like yeah. it makes them really pop. Um, I haven't tried that as much with video, but I feel like if I were shooting video, I would do classic Chrome, um, Astia or Eterna, just Eterna. Eterna mostly just because it has like less contrast built into it. And so I can always mm -hmm. add it back. It's a good balance. Um, but yeah, like skin tones, it can feel a little like washed out and like not yeah. as vibrant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I feel like when I bring it into Resolve, like when I shot Classic Chrome and stuff like that, you can still bring up the shadows, like you can bring down the highlights really well, like you can adjust the contrast really well. Um, and the image, like it doesn't fall apart super easily. So yeah. that part is yeah. super nice. And if you're looking for yeah. something like if you're looking for a way to save time and not have to process log footage every time you bring it in, then like it definitely makes it more of a viable option now that we have the 10 bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so speaking of that process, what's your workflow with F log two? Are, are you in DaVinci? Yes. I'm in DaVinci. Okay, good. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I knew, I knew you were, but I just, I just need to just say it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell us your workflow. I'm, I'm kind of a weird colorist. I don't have like a super, <laughs> Uh, I don't have like a specific workflow for every single project. It really depends okay. on a ton of different variables like time, budget, what it was shot on. Mm. Um, like there's so many different things you have to consider. So DaVinci, uh, DaVinci doesn't support F-Log2 yet um, in their mm. color space transform. There's no F-Log2 mm. um, function. There's F-Log and there's F-Gamut is is rec 2020 it's the same oh, okay. uh okay. color space so you want to make sure you convert it from rec 2020 to rec 709 and then f log to rec 709 if you're shooting in f log 2 then um this is where i get to plug my LUTs. um there you go there you go like from from this point forward i always want to be completely transparent with my f log LUTs because you do not actually need to buy f log conversion LUTs. Um, you can download them for free on Fuji's website. They have F-Log, F-Log 2 um, to Rec. 709. And then they also have a, a uh, you can convert it to Eterna. Um, and you can download those from their website. Um, but what I found is I'm always making like specific corrections on that. So I wanted to build my own F-Log and F-Log 2 to Rec. 709 conversions. Mm -hmm. um, because like there's there's multiple ways that you can do it. And it really has a big effect on skin tone. That's one of my biggest priorities. Um, yeah. And then, you know, like all of the tones in the image, the tone curve, everything like that. So I've actually built my own conversions that 
I think are a bit more um, on the creative and pleasing side compared to Fuji's conversions, which are more on the technical side. Mm-hmm. Um, and they kind of leave out some of the creative decision making that you can have. Mm-hmm. I can kind of describe like my basic, a basic yeah, node tree that you yeah. can do. But yeah. basically you want to have your F log conversion or F log two conversion in the middle of the no tree or even like towards the end um, okay. where in the middle you have your F log conversion. Um, and that's the first thing I would apply. So I would okay. just like right off the bat, go to the color page and apply a conversion LUT or a color space transform to the footage. Boom. Now you're viewing it in rec 709. So it's transformed. Right. I would make a node, a serial node before the conversion. And that's where I would do things like exposure, white balance, um, contrast, saturation, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And for exposure, I would use the offset wheel. Um, mm-hmm. So using the offset wheel in conjunction with a transform after it basically allows you to adjust the image like linearly up and down. And then when it is sent through the log conversion, that kind of um, like it adds the contrast. So you kind of have like boundaries on the top and bottom. I had no idea how to use that. Okay, good to know. Yeah. I'm watching this over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's super satisfying. Once you have the conversion built in, when you do the offset and you watch it on the scopes, as you get higher, it, it'll it compress your highlights and it'll kind of keep those in range and mm-hmm. it'll do the same thing for shadows. So you'll have a nice roll off um, without clipping or you know blowing out the highlights. Um, so you want to do that kind of stuff before the conversion. Um, and white balance, all that stuff. You can even use the offset, like the law or the uh, the offset wheel to kind of fine tune the white balance. Um, and then after the conversion is where you do creative adjustments. Um, you would do like, if you have like a creative look that you wanna build using curves, or if you have a creative LUT, you do that after the conversion. Um, And then you can do like a secondary adjustment um, if you're doing like, if you want to like pull the shadows down a bit more, do like bring the gamma down. That's kind of where you do your like extra tone curve adjustments, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then if you're doing any power windows, you do that before the conversion. Um, Yeah, that makes sense. Because you're kind of adjusting the light and I would recommend doing those in parallel nodes um, if you have multiple, so it gets complicated fast, but basically I'm sure. Yeah. Primary adjustments, log conversion, secondary adjustments, creative look, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. If you're doing noise reduction, you want that to be your very first node. So before anything else, you want to do your noise reduction and then send that through. I've actually always done it after. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's not going to give you bad results, but It'll help you, like it'll help the conversion. If you're doing any um, qualifier or curves, Mm -hmm. it'll Mm -hmm. make that cleaner if you apply Mm -hmm. the noise reduction first right off the bat. So, Got you. Yeah. Got you. Got you. That is a great tip. I need to hear that. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. Cool. Yeah. All right, y'all. So that wraps it up for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was a long one, but I hope you learned something from it. I sure did, as you saw in the video, and I definitely have been adding that to my workflow in terms of color grading. Uh, But again, let me know who you want to see on this channel next. Not to say that I'm going to get everybody, but it'd be great to continue to show different facets of the filmmaking process, not just coming from me because filmmaking takes a team and other experts are way better than the knots that I know. So uh, yeah, I catch you guys on the next one. See you.